we still have some of the highest levels of disparity when it comes to health disparity, lack of housing. We talk about a third of the people on the Navajo Nation do not have running water or electricity. Enslavement and the dispossession of indigenous peoples are foundational to U.S. democracy. It's imperative to not only center blackness, but also to center indigenous peoples. Both of these things have to be centered if we're in fact going to move forward. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Exploitation of black and indigenous people was integral to the founding and formation of the United States and to the economic power that enabled the country standing today as an international superpower. But the nature of that exploitation wasn't exactly the same. In this month's episode of Meet the BIPOC Press, I'm happy to welcome back Mitra Kalita of Epicenter NYC and Sarah Lomax-Reese of Philadelphia's WURD. Together, they're the co-founders of URL Media, a network of independently owned and operated black and brown media outlets, and together, every month, they host this special episode. Today, they're going to explore the intersections between blackness and indigeneity. One of our guests, Kyle Mays, asks, how can we imagine and put into praxis a world in the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy? To answer that question, Sarah, Mitra, over to you. I look forward to joining you at the end of this episode. Thanks so much, Laura. It's great to be back after a brief hiatus. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about this intersectionality of Black and Indigenous peoples, our struggles, our uh, shared oppression, and our shared strength. And to have that conversation, we have Levi Rickard, who is the founder and the publisher of Native News Online. He's also the author of Visions for a Better Indian Country, and he's a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. And we're also joined by Dr. Kyle Mays, who is from the Saginaw Chippewa Nation, and he's an associate professor of African American Studies, American Indian Studies, and History at the University of California in Los Angeles. He's also the author of An Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. So welcome, Levi and Kyle. It's great to have you with us. Um, there's a lot of shared history between Black and Indigenous people, but a lot of that history is unknown and untold. And so I wanted to kick the conversation off with asking about what are the differences? What are the shared experiences but also those things that have been unique around the oppression of Black and Indigenous peoples. And I'll start with you, uh, Levi Rickert from Native News. First, let me start with the, the uh, shared, shared things that we have in common with African Americans. And you go back historically, uh, when slaves would actually leave plantations, they would, they would be... Uh, in, in some cases, actually, they would go to like the Seminole tribe down in Florida, uh, some Choctaw nation, Chickasaw nations, and actually would hide out and, and they would uh, be welcomed by the native people back in the 1800s and I would even say the 1700s. So there's that common ground there. I, I would say the difference has been, and it really came to light during the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, when some, some American Indians felt as if they really didn't need to become part of the civil rights movement because we had treaties. However, to me, that is that, and I was a child obviously back then, but thinking back, we should have joined because, because treaties, what treaty has been totally fulfilled, absolutely zero. So to me, that was a lame argument, but that was one of the biggest differences back then. We can begin with one of the most important uh, Native intellectuals in the 20th century, Vine Deloria Jr., who wrote Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto, that the major differences between African Americans and Native peoples was that Indigenous peoples were seeking treaty rights or simply for the United States government to honor the treaties. And as Levi pointed out, 
they have violated every treaty, or at least not honored every treaty that they've ever made with every uh, nation in the U.S. And the second part of that is African Americans are fighting for civil civil rights or integration, right? But what sort of gets flattened in that particular history using someone like Stokely Carmichael, who would change his name to Kwame Ture, he's very adamant in saying that this was native people's land. And as African Americans, should we be seeking integration into the US? And what things in common do we have with indigenous peoples? And I think that was a powerful moment in the history of black and indigenous interactions. Now, as far as similarities, I think there are many similarities, whether it's a shared ideology about who, what sort of oppression that they're experiencing. Um, now, we can say that people of African descent were enslaved and indigenous peoples experienced settler colonialism, that is the taking of their land. And those are, you know, historical different phenomena, historically different phenomena. But the commonalities, if we really consider those Africans who were kidnapped from the continent, those were indigenous peoples who had their own languages, land and cultures. And even though they were enslaved, that just did not just that was not just evaporated or erased. And I think that's an important thing to really think about uh, in pre-revolutionary America. There's this shared oppression. Um, clearly black Americans and uh, Native Americans have, have uh, experienced, although it's very different. But I also see that there are um, challenges around acceptance and embracing of, uh, of, of black people in particular, because like, as I look at you, Kyle, you look like a black man, you look like a black American to me. <laughs> this but, is true. And, and so many of us as black Americans have Native American ancestry, but we can't necessarily trace it directly to uh, a Native American tribe. But it seems like there's not necessarily the reciprocated embrace of black people who have native heritage in the Native American culture as um, there is in the black culture. And I, I wanted to see if we could talk about that um, differentiation. I think one of the differences to consider is that um, indigenous nations have their own protocols as to who um, is a citizen or not. Right. And while someone might look black, someone might look white and I'm not and I'll get to what I consider anti blackness sometimes while someone might look black, someone might look white. It's about your citizenship within that particular nation right now many issues, whether it's blood quantum and so forth have been imposed upon indigenous nations, and I would argue that they do have the ability if they desired really to alter some of uh, those protocols as to who can become a citizen or not, but it's not very simple either. Now, certainly I think there are various forms of anti-Blackness. Um, my family is from Detroit and they certainly experienced uh, various forms of anti-Blackness, but they're also prominent activists in the city of Detroit around education, around culture in the city of Detroit, at least since the 1960s. So. It, it is a it is a thing, but there's also been various forms of um, uh, we'll say native erasure from from black people as well. So it's a very complicated issue, whether that's nationhood and how uh, we'll say Afro indigenous peoples are treated both by black people and indigenous peoples. Levi, what do you say about that? Well, and let me just say this: when I attend national conferences. For instance, the National Congress of the American Indians. I'm really, I, I, first time I went there and years ago, I was really struck with the notion that, wow, Native Americans come in all colors and sizes, so to speak. You can see a blonde, blue eyed Native American. You can see it, who, who someone appears to be African American, Native American. And I want to say this that we have come a long way and I will speak about the Cherokee Freedmen, which was very controversial. I mean, uh, Representative uh, Walters held up some housing legislation because she didn't feel as if African-Americans who are Cherokees were getting the proper due justice. And the, the current chief, uh, Chuck Hoskin has really brought the tribe 
I'm going to say light years. And it's, and it's, it's an evolving situation. And, and the good news is it's going in the right direction where they are embracing the African-Americans who are in fact Cherokee. So uh, throughout the United States, you see various tribes. One, one tribe here in Michigan, here on Potawatomi, when I go to their functions, it seems that there are, I want to say a good 25% who are African-Americans. And so they are totally embraced. Some are on tribal council. And so it's, it's a good, it's good news. We are moving in the right direction. I think the country is just starting to catch up to um, some of the history and the overlaps that you're mentioning. Levi, can I ask you what changed over the last Two or three years, um, you know, we've talked, of course, on this um, show a lot about the death of George Floyd. I don't know if that's what prompted it or if there's something more that led us to this current consciousness. Certainly the George, George Floyd uh, killing and then the, the riots and the uprising that took place afterward, you can see the coming together. I mean, for instance, the, the Washington football team's name was changed as a result of what happened to George Floyd. You can tie it back with AOC telling a radio station that it's time for Snyder to change the name. And all of a sudden, corporate America was really, really aware of the fact that George Floyd was, there's some legitimate legitimacy to the concerns surrounding his death and how African-Americans and other brown people were treated, quite frankly. And so when AOC tied that in, they asked, the mayor of Washington, she agreed. And then for, next thing you know, federal expert, uh, FedEx pulled the funding. When corporate America, and that's the sad reality. It's oftentimes in America, it's always driven by money. And But at the same time, in this case, it worked out okay. But but there has been a shift and I'm happy with it. I, I personally, through the years, have totally embraced African-American community. It's just just... I grew up in a church that was African American predominantly, and so uh, I just I just feel like as if it's time, and I'm happy it's happening. Kyle, what do you think? What's changed? I think the real uh, beginning of the change was probably the activism around the Dakota Access Pipeline in um, 2015, and so for me that was a uh, also the Flint water crisis, and that was a watershed moment where. Uh, you also had the movement for Black Lives uh, actually making a statement in solidarity with uh, the resistors at um, the Sandy Rock Sioux Tribe who are resisting the Dakota Access Pipeline. So for me, that was really the first moment, at least since um, the 1970s, where you found this major intersection of Black and Indigenous protesters. So that's certainly, those are two particular events that I recall very recently that really started to see a shift in uh, Native consciousness as far as Black people really being aware and invested uh, in a very mainstream sense of the things happening to uh, Indigenous nations, in, in this case, in particular, the Sandy Rock Sioux Tribe. We often at URL Media talk about centering Blackness in our own organization, as well as the organizations we work with. Do you hear that in a different way, given your overlapping identities? I just wonder, as an Afro-Indigenous, both scholar and person, how you hear that. Yeah, it's it's pretty complicated for me. So, um, you know, I'll use as a jumping point the Kambahi River Collective Statement, uh, authored by folks like Barbara Smith and so forth in 1977. And they have a, and I'm paraphrasing here, they have a quote here that says, when all, when Black women are free, all people are free. Now, on the surface, that that makes a lot of sense, but I would always think differently about that in the sense of, and this is related to centering Blackness. So if all Black people are free, does that necessarily mean a return of land to Indigenous peoples, right? And I think that has to be a part of the conversation. So I think it's uh, imperative to not only center Blackness, but also to center Indigenous peoples, because upon whose land were, indigenous, were uh, uh, African-Americans exploited. This was indigenous land. And thus, I argue in the book that the enslavement of uh, people of African descent and the dispossession of indigenous peoples were foundational to US democracy. And so I see that both of these things have to be centered if we're in fact going to move forward. You know, Kyle, I was watching a, uh, a talk that you gave 
And one of the questions was about cultural appropriation versus appreciation, cultural appreciation. And one of the things that, that happens a lot now in, in places are land acknowledgements, where um, there's, there's a recognition that we are on uh, indigenous people's lands and there's a, a ceremony or some type of acknowledgement that happens. And I'm curious, as we look towards Indigenous Peoples Day on October 10th, what is actually legitimately going to move the needle to improve the lives of Indigenous people in this country? I think one of the major things is, one, honoring the treaties. Like, that's this sort of a uh, basis. And two, returning land. So there's certainly uh, a land back movement. The city of Oakland had returned like some portions of Oakland, or at least acknowledge it as being native land, uh, which which is fine. And the Onondaga Nation, the state of New York returning um, acres to them in central New York. So we can talk a lot about, you know, the changing of things, things getting better, more representation. But to me, fundamentally, it has to be about returning land because returning land will deal with all sorts of issues around white supremacy, settler colonialism, and so forth. And Sarah, first of all, let me thank you for, for using the term Indigenous Peoples Day versus Columbus Day. So we're already making progress. And I was, I was happy when you did that. Uh, but, but, but to the point, you know, the land acknowledgement is a big piece. And, and, and it makes me stop. And I'm a Native person. And I, I kind of smile when I, when I see it. And I hear it happening when I'm at a public event. And I think it's just really really there again showing their respect to the people our ancestors were here and the acknowledgement of the land and acknowledgement of the waterways that 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 this com country through corporate greed has totally totally destroyed our environment to the point where we are in a major major crisis and so it, it all ties together but just the land acknowledgement water acknowledgement but I'm going to go right back to to fix the needs of American Indians. We need to really keep the gas pedal on getting Congress to appropriate the proper level of funding. We still have some of the highest levels of disparity when it comes to health disparity, lack of housing. You talk about a third of the people on the Navajo Nation do not have running water or electricity. That is third world living conditions. And this is what our native people are still living with. And we need to really work hard. And, and I wanna say this, we have made progress. We even seen some sh short-term progress, even since the stimulus from the pandemic funding. But so money does solve a lot of problems and the average American is one paycheck away from being homeless. So tell me money doesn't make a difference. It makes all the difference in, in many cases. And we're coming up on very a very contentious midterm election um, in November that is could could reshape uh, the way government happens in the country. And I want to see if both of you could speak to what are the key issues in Black and Indigenous communities, those intersectional issues that are going to mobilize turnout in those uh, communities. There again, I'll say with a smile on my face, we had the first ever Alaska Native who beat Sarah Palin to become a congresswoman, Mary Patello. When I asked her about it, I said, Mary, you're pro-choice. And what's the issue for you around that? And she said, for your audience, I'm reminded of how often Native Americans, Alaska Natives were sterilized without their knowledge or consent. And this happened during the 1970s, it's very well documented. And she said that is one of the basis of what her thought process is. And I saw something on Twitter just this morning, she put on that the government should not tell indigenous people when and where to have children. And so I, I just think that that's gonna be, a, I think that's gonna be a big piece of, a, of the midterm elections. Certainly issues around sovereignty, we did a study and we're about ready to launch a survey to, to, to really glean from our community what's important for them during this election. But I, I'm going to borrow from the last presidential election when we surveyed our, our, our audience and it was sovereignty issues. American Indians still want to protect their sovereignty as nations. Right now we have a critical uh, 
Supreme Court case, Breakin versus USA, um, coming up in November, November 9th, I think it's going to be heard. And it's really a pushback to the Indian Child Welfare Act from 1978. And what really frustrates me about this, it's been going on for a number of years now, now the Supreme Court, but the, and, and it was, the big pushback has been from the Goldwater Institute. Well, back in 1977, when Barry Goldwater was a U.S. Senator, whose institute was named after, he voted in favor of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And it just makes sense that tribal nations have the right to raise our children. And that really bothers a lot of right-wing conservatives. But those are some of the key issues for us. How about you, Kyle? Yeah, I echo uh, all those things, but uh, a particular focus on urban areas as well. Uh, so housing, issues around housing, uh, the ability to afford housing. As we know, interest rates are really high and the ability to purchase a home. Um, and there's, and I'm in LA, increasing homelessness amongst all sorts of populations with uh, people of color, indigenous peoples, uh, both from uh, Central America and South America uh, who have come over here and also indigenous peoples uh, local to Los Angeles. So housing is, is one of those major issues that has been ongoing, uh, both on and on the reservation and clean water, whether that's Jackson, Mississippi, uh, whether that's uh, Flint, whether it's Levi mentioned earlier on the Navajo uh, reservation and various reservations with clean water and those environmental issues remain at the core, whether you're on the reservation or, or in a city. So those remain very important issues throughout Indian country. Thank you both so much for being with us on Meet the BIPOC Press today. Thank you. Thank you, Chief McWitch. My pleasure. Well, thanks you too. That was a great conversation. As you did, Mitra, I was particularly taken with that interesting point about homelessness, houselessness, and land rights. Um, that connection, I wonder, is that how that's getting handled in campaigning. And, and more broadly, I was interested in organizing. Are there examples that the either of you are aware of, even this election season, where that alliance between African Americans and Native Americans is, is coming into play? One thing that um, struck me was Levi's feeling like the acknowledgement and even the mention of indigenous is such progress. I think the other point that does relate to politics as you're asking about is the Dakota pipeline. It really um, struck me how it can feel like the turning of the screw from a news cycle perspective. But then when you stack all these events against each other, um, again, you start to see how that really does affect change. Um, I might sound overly positive, Laura. And, um... <laughs> well, just to, just to even the score, I will point out that that Mary Patola victory in Alaska, while huge against Sarah Palin, was in a special election, which is going to be refought this November with a whole lot of people paying a whole lot more attention and probably pouring more dark money into it. The thing that... Um was interesting to me about the conversation is that we don't always or often have uh, a focus and a spotlight on this intersectionality between Black and Indigenous cultures, communities, um, movements. And I, I think that one of the things that excites me about URL media is that we kind of force those conversations because we are showcasing the content that Native News Online is doing us on uh, alongside what the Haitian Times is doing, alongside what um, you know Epicenter is doing, and so we're bringing all of these um, different cultures and perspectives together in one place and identifying those shared experiences, those shared uh, challenges, and um, and one of the things that that Kyle Mays said in, uh, in one of his talks was that that's a very dangerous thing. History has shown us, he pointed to Fred Hampton, who was a young man, I think he was 21 in Chicago, who was bringing all of these different uh, uh, groups, racial and ethnic groups together to fight for, to overturn poverty and to overcome uh, all of these, these uh, areas of disenfranchisement 
that cut across different racial and ethnic groups. And he was essentially murdered by the state. So it is, it, there is a historical framework that makes this work somewhat um, dangerous because to mobilize people of color writ large can be um, very transformative and again, very challenging to the system. Well, you are all medias doing intersectionality in action, and that's why we love checking in with you every month. People want to know more about the Fred Hampton story. I encourage you to check out Judas and the Black Messiah. I appreciate you both and look forward to next month's episode of Meet the BIPOC Press. Sarah Lomax Reese, Mitra Kalita, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.